By July 1993, our year-long trip across Africa was finally coming to an end. We had arrived in Zimbabwe after four very busy weeks in Malawi and an amazing month in Mozambique, and our team was now planning to disperse from Harare Airport to fly back to our various homes. For me, there was a real sense of closure and completion finishing the trip in Zimbabwe. This was a place where I'd spent six months back in 1988 and 1989 in my gap year after my A-levels, and it was on returning to England after that trip that the initial idea for the Land Rover trip was first born. And so for me, arriving back in Zimbabwe was, was wonderful. This was a country that I loved, where I had many happy memories. And as I look back now at 30 years of my life, I've been in and out of Zimbabwe numerous times, and I realise that Zimbabwe in itself is an Ebenezer stone for me. I have so many good memories of, of my life there. I remember arriving there as an 18-year-old. I went there to teach for six months in a rural school. I was a young adult. I was leaving home for the first time. I was baptised in the farm dam. I spent time getting to know the kids that I was teaching. I spent time with them and their families in their huts, learning Shona. I learned to shoot the catapult and was hunting with the kids out in the bush, sitting with them, eating sadsa, fishing in the dam. And I built many friendships there that have lasted until this day. People that I worked with in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique and down in South Africa. And so Zimbabwe is a place of, of rich memories. I remember traveling with a group 24 hours overnight on the old steam train via Bulawayo up to Victoria Falls, one of the most amazing wonders of the world. And I've been there many times over the years. I've been to the falls in August at the height of the dry season when there's hardly any water in the Zambezi River and the falls are almost dry, but it's still incredibly beautiful. And then I've been there in February and March, fresh after the rains, when the Zambezi is full of water and millions of tonnes of water are cascading over these mighty falls. It's a mile wide and it's just immense. It cascades 100 metres down and as you look out into the spray you're being drenched by the spray and you can see a, a, a perfect rainbow forming in the falls. It's a, a place of incredible beauty. In 1994, just after we got married, Miranda and I travelled around East Africa and we spent several weeks in Zimbabwe. We stayed with friends in Harare and then we hitchhiked over to the Eastern Highlands and we spent three days walking. We climbed Mount Nyangani, the highest mountain in Zimbabwe. And then, years later, we lived in Mozambique. In Mozambique, the neighbouring country to Zimbabwe, and we were often travelling in and out of Zimbabwe. At that stage, Zimbabwe was the breadbasket of southern Africa, exporting food everywhere. And Mozambique was just recovering from years of civil war. And so we would travel from Mozambique into Zimbabwe. We would do our food shopping in Zimbabwe, stock up and take the food back into Mozambique. Zimbabwe was a place of, of respite. It was a place where we holidayed. It was a place where we had good friendships. Every time friends from England visited us in those years, they would fly into Harare Airport in Zimbabwe. We would drive out from Mozambique, pick them up and take them home. I remember back in 2001 when Miranda was pregnant. We picked friends up and we drove up to Victoria Falls with them. We went to Wangi Game Park. I remember we saw my first lion kill there, we saw my first leopard there, and we camped out in our roof tent in a small campsite in the middle of the, of the park with just a flimsy metal fence between us and the roaring lion. Incredible, exhilarating. And then from there we drove fast down to Bulawayo for my friend Dan and I to watch a cricket match. We watched Zimbabwe play India. And we sat there on the grass playing chess, watching Sachin Tendulkar play cricket. Amazing memories, rich times. The word Zimbabwe comes, I believe, from an old Shona word, which means great house of stone. It comes from an area in Zimbabwe known as the Great Zimbabwe Ruins. It's in Majvingo. And I remember going there with, with our team back in 93. I'd, I'd read about the Great Zimbabwe Ruins and then for us to be there, it was, it was amazing. These ruins are actually the largest prehistoric remains in sub-Saharan Africa. They stretch over several hundred hectares of savanna with granite outcrops on top of one of the granite rocks. There's a fortress built with this old granite stone. There's a, a giant enclosure, which is, I think, 250 metres in circumference. 
there's a conical tower and this is all perfectly built dry stone rock in places it's five meters tall it's three meters wide this ancient remains of an old empire the Monomatapa Shona Empire from the 11th 12th 13th century and at that time Zimbabwe was trading things like ivory and various precious stones out across the great um, the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe Mozambique down to the coast the Safala coastline and and it was being traded with Arab Swahili traders and taken by Dao across to the Middle East to Oman and then on to India and China and Zimbabwe was trading with the world over the years I've watched with sadness as Zimbabwe has been through hard times. Back in 1988, when I first visited Zimbabwe, there was three Zim dollars to one pound. In 2008, it was 15 million dollars to the pound. It's been through 20 years of economic hardship, of massive devaluation, of hyperinflation, of land seizures incredibly hard times and a country that was a breadbasket that was exporting food to the world is now a country that's been in need. For several years we were living in Cape Town and at that time I traveled often up into Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is known as one of the kind of the mothers in YWAM. It was the first place in Africa that had long-term training back in 1972 and 74. Many Zimbabweans are in YWAM. They work all over the world. I've got YWAM friends in Zimbabwe, in Asia, in India, and in the Americas, in Europe, in South Africa, and many countries in Africa. But it's been through challenging times. I remember on one of those trips up to Bulawayo, where there's been a, Zim a YWAM team since 1982, we were taking in a vehicle full of food and medical supplies for our friends there. We stopped at the border. The border official said probably the strangest thing I've ever heard a border official say to me. He said, I hope you've got food. There's no food up there. And that image of Zimbabwe is a, a place that's bereft of food. There was a billboard near the Bait Bridge border just as you're about to cross the Limpopo River. And it said, we know why you're here in South Africa. It's murder over there. Strange thing for a billboard to be saying. And yet there were four million Zimbabweans living in exile in South Africa at that point, having fled Zimbabwe with its empty shops, economic depression, seeking life somewhere else. And as we took food into our friends in Zimbabwe, it was with a real sense of recognizing the challenge they were going through, just sitting with our friends, listening to the tough times they were with and just trying to support them in those times. I remember on one of those trips, my friend and I stayed at a private game reserve. On that game reserve there were several huts, we stayed in one of the huts, but there was a beautiful rondavel made out of stone. It was a kind of an open kitchen bar area. It had beautiful dry stone walls. It had a lovely thatched roof. It had gorgeous, exquisite hardwood beams, ivory tusks on the wall. It was a place of real beauty. But then, several months later, we visited again. We stayed once more overnight in this game reserve. And to my shock, I saw that there'd been a fire which had spread through and the rondavel had been ruined in the fire. The thatch was gone, the exquisite wooden beams were burnt, and the stones in the wall were blackened and suddened and some of them had fallen over and there was a pile of, of rubble in the corner of the rondavel. And somehow for me that was a, a picture, a metaphor, of the state of the nation. Zimbabwe, this great house of stone, had been burnt by fire. The walls had tumbled down, blackened by soot. And as I travelled in the country on that visit, I saw men standing hungry, gaunt, outside shops, unemployed, and looked inside the shops and the, the shelves were virtually empty. Tough times. 
And as I sat there in that ruined Rondavel, I was thinking about the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah returning to Jerusalem to find the stone wall had been destroyed and had lain in ruins for 70 plus years and his passion and vision to rebuild the walls and he rallied people around him to rebuild the walls and I remembered the taunt of Sanballat who said to Nehemiah can you take these stones blackened as they are can you take this pile of ruins and rebuild the wall and my hope for Zimbabwe as I think back to so many happy memories but I look at the, the challenging times they've been through. My hope for Zimbabwe is the simple fact that Nehemiah was a, was a restorer. He took those blackened stones and he rebuilt the wall with those very stones. And that's my prayer for Zimbabwe. That God would restore, that God would rebuild. And that the challenging times that this beautiful nation has been through would finally come to an end.